and I am going to introduce Frank. Dr. Guevara has been a full-time assistant professor for three years at the University of Arizona Global Campus. He has worked in higher education for six years, teaching both face-to-face -face and online. Prior to the collegiate teaching, Dr. Guevara spent 15 years in a program administration, having managed programs in California, Texas, North Carolina, and Colorado in various sectors with enrollments over 200 children. And then he had the privilege of starting his career teaching in a lab school at Stanford University and Pacific Oaks, as well as within corporate and private early learning programs, working with infants through school agers, where he learned how to promote children's development through active hands-on activities and engagement. Dr. Guevara, we thank you so much for being here. We're so honored to have you and the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Dr. Shipley, and welcome to everyone who's joining us today. As Dr. Shipley mentioned, I had the distinct privilege of working at Bing Nursery School, which is the laboratory program at Stanford University during my undergraduate education. And there, woodworking was a weekly occurrence in our preschool programs. I really came to appreciate how incredible of a learning experience this is for children and adults. So I hope to share with you some insights from my personal experiences, as well as a variety of online resources on this topic. Now feel free to take notes, but at the end of this webinar, we'll post a handout that contains all the resources that are cited today. So you can explore them further at your leisure. Okay, let's get going. So today, we'll look at the many benefits of woodworking using real tools. Much like there are stages of drawing and block building, a few authors have proposed stages of woodworking and we'll discuss these. Next, we'll look at into the practical aspects of introducing tools, planning for safety, and end with recommendations for setup of materials, as well as some extension and alternative activities for those who wanna start with some baby steps. Now, let me warn you, the next slide might be a little harrowing, but often when people hear woodworking, real tools and children, this is the type of image that flashes through their mind. And make no mistake that safety should always be your number one consideration when working with children, whether it's on the playground, using scissors, cooking, and definitely woodworking. But in my many years of working with children, I never had an injury that couldn't be handled by a regular Band-Aid. As Pete Morehouse, a respected author and educator on this topic has stated, woodworking is actually a low risk activity if you take certain precautions. But don't just take our words for it. Let me try to put your mind at ease by looking at some of the statistics regarding child injuries in childcare programs. Although there is no national database on childcare injuries, there is some research on the topic. And as you can see here, injuries are categorized into four groups. Falls, injury from being struck by or hit by an object or person, overexertion, and bites, stings. The light blue bar represents all injuries treated in emergency rooms for being struck by or against an object or person, which accounted for 18% for ages one to four and 23% for children five to nine years of age. Now keep in mind that this could be from being hit by a shovel, a wooden block, or some other cause. So the percent strictly from woodworking is much lower. I ask you to take a moment and think about whether 
any of you would hesitate from sending children outside to play on a climbing structure? Probably not. But as we see here, injuries from falls comprise about 40% of ER visits in childcare. So it's good to put our sensitivities of risk to injury into perspective. But let me reiterate that any time children are using tools, whether it's a hammer, scissors, stapler, or a garden spade, it's important that safety protocols be followed and for teachers to be actively supervising these activities. Let's look at all the wonderful benefits of using real tools. The most obvious benefits relate to motor development. It takes a lot of fine motor control to hold the nail still while trying to hammer it into a piece of wood. Those same pincer grasp muscles will aid in later writing skill development. And wielding a hammer to hit that nail requires the coordination of several large muscle groups, including the triceps, biceps, wrist, and hand muscles. Not only that, but consider the amount of eye-hand coordination required. I'm sure many of you have seen a child focus all of their energies just to cut on a line, oh, so slowly. So think of the eye, hand, arm coordination needed to swing a hammer and actually hit a nail on its head. Moreover, it takes neuromuscular control, which is the ability to regulate the amount of force needed to achieve a specific outcome. If we hit the nail too softly, it may just fall over. If we hit it too hard, you might have a pinched finger. Children learn to modulate the amount of force they exert when using real tools because their actions have concrete outcomes. If a child is using a hand drill, that requires a bike pedaling motion while keeping the top steady, all the time while watching and monitoring the hole that's being dug. It's quite complicated, sort of like tapping your head while rubbing your belly. And those movements are different from the back and forth movement required to saw through a piece of wood while remaining balanced in an upright position. But let's take a look at some of the many cognitive benefits. We learn about shape and size. We can practice measurement and explore scale. Children learn about one-to-one -one correspondence as well as cause and effect as each movement of the saw results in a deeper and deeper groove until that one piece of wood splits into two. Consider the amount of problem solving that was required to execute this creation. Woodworking requires children to define the task, make a plan of action, decide how to proceed, refine their plan, and respond accordingly as their work evolves. It's all the goals of STEAM education wrapped up into one beautiful activity. As children gain more agility with woodworking, we see them begin to use divergent thinking and drift into expressive art and original creation. Woodworking provides children with affordances to realize their inner dreams and desires. 
It's the same creative process we observe in block building, Play-Doh or clay work, and in the art center. As Deborah Priest reminds us, children's natural tendency is to make. And woodworking gives children a blank canvas. There are ample social and emotional benefits as well. Focus, persistence, feeling powerful. Recall that scene from the movie Castaway when Tom Hanks' character celebrates by shouting out, I have made fire. The act of creation is so rewarding to the sense of self. Woodworking gives children that power to make and the power to break. Woodworking is risky. There's an aura of excitement about doing it, especially with real tools. You know, the kind that adults get to use. But there's also social modeling such that the onlooker, the little girl on the left, soon becomes the doer. It provides children opportunities to, to gain confidence as they see their efforts yield the results they hoped for. But it also teaches children about responsibility, respect for materials, and respect for others. Sharing and teamwork are required, both of which promote self-control and self-regulation. And for those kinesthetic learners, woodworking provides a unique sensory experience through the smell and feel of wood. Freshly cut pine is a magical experience. Like writing and block building, stages of woodworking have been proposed as you see here. Children start with exploration and experimentation, getting to know the tools, the materials, and the actions involved in this endeavor. They soon advance to simple combining or connecting of pieces, which we call construction. As their skills become more developed, those constructions become more refined with increased complexity. Lastly, children begin to express themselves through woodworking as a medium much like we've seen with some of the complex constructions that I've shared previously. And ultimately they can move into the domain of crafting wood by using lathes, chisels, and turning wood as we do in carpentry. Introducing tools is of particular importance for those programs who do not have a woodworking component to their curriculum currently. In my training, since the school I worked at regularly did this, using tools was just a natural part of our learning culture. And only as we had new children enroll, did we take the time to introduce tools to these novices. But there's so much to be learned about each tool that it could be the focus of a unit of study completely separate from woodworking. As you can see in this image of a claw hammer, I bet you didn't know 
that hammers have faces, eyes, and cheeks on their heads. So consider all the possible conversations and new vocabulary that can be learned by introducing the range of tools used in woodworking. Several of the authors that I researched suggested having a tool show and tell session in which you discuss the names of the tools, what they're used for, how to hold them, and how to manipulate them. All of this done as a precursor to actually using the tools. In this way, children can explore the tools in a low stress environment before they head to the workbench. If you do this, you can discuss which parts are sharp and pointy. You can safely explore the weight of various tools to gain a visceral sense of the strength needed to operate a hammer. You can practice the safe ways for holding and transporting the tools. And this is an optimal time to establish rules and ensure that children know and understand them. I mentioned before that in my experience, woodworking was an integral part of the curriculum. But as new children entered our classes, they had to be introduced to the world of woodworking. So the guidelines that we followed there were to introduce a child to one tool at the workbench under the close supervision with only two to three other children allowed at a time so that the teacher could give more attention to the novice woodworker. This novice would then work on particular skills over repeated exposure under this controlled context until they were able to graduate up to the next tool. And then that tool is introduced for a week or so. And then we introduce a third tool and so on and so on. Before long, that novice child has gained facility in safely handling all the tools in your program. For example, when learning how to saw, you can follow this procedure. First, draw a line where you want to cut the wood. Next, guide the child to place the saw on the mark as close to the handle as possible. Have them next draw the saw back and it will start to cut the wood ever so slightly. By repeating this process of placing the saw towards the back of the handle and drawing back repeatedly, we start to develop a small groove in the wood. So they could then practice going back and forth. Now let's pivot slightly and talk about some safety rules. Although I stated earlier that woodworking is a low risk activity, your first rule of adult safety is adult supervision is required at all times. A corollary to this is that if you don't know what you're doing, don't do it. Ask any contractor and they'll tell you that injuries happen when people try to do something they don't know how to do. Safety goggles are another high priority in my book. Most, but not all, of the images that I've shared with you today 
show children wearing safety goggles. But it's something that I would strongly advise you to integrate into your safety protocols. On the handout that you'll receive at the end of this presentation, there are links for recommended supplies. And one of the first items on the list are safety goggles. I found this 24 count of safety goggles on Amazon for $24. At a dollar a piece, it's a great investment for peace of mind. Never, never, never use treated lumber when we're working with children because it's full of chemicals that can be dangerous if children happen to get splinters or happen to get a fleck in their eye in spite of those safety glasses. And although there's a whole rage right now of creating anything and everything out of pallets because they're readily available, there are certain markings that you need to look for to ensure the wood isn't chemically treated. So in my opinion, it's easiest just to avoid them. Another consideration is that you match the tools to the developmental levels and sizes of the children in your group. Take a look at these four hammers. If you're working with older toddlers, you might use the one on the far left. A five-year preschooler could probably use the next one over. And for older children, you might need something with more heft, like the two on the right. But we'll get into the details in the next section. Just keep in mind, much like the tables, chairs, puzzles, etc., that you have in your classroom, all materials need to be developmentally appropriate. Before we get into specific rules, I want to encourage you to embrace a growth mindset when it comes to children's capabilities. Children will sink down or rise up to the expectations we set for them. Deborah Pierce <laughs> provides a no-nonsense, very practical approach to setting behavioral expectations for doing woodworking. She says, if a tool is carried away from the workbench, if it's handled too close to another child, or if a tool is deliberately misused and the teachers have already given more than two reminders, then natural consequences should be applied. Now, what those natural consequences are is up to you. But as with most classroom rules, you will get more buy-in when children and teachers are part of the decision-making process. So remember those show and tell discussions we spoke about earlier? Those are the perfect time to go over your expectations as well as any natural consequences you decide to implement. The website myece.org New Zealand had this list of safety rules. Ultimately, you'll need to look at your program's philosophy, how you've set up your woodworking center, get teacher and child input, and then decide which rules you'll want to establish for your program. But these are a great starting point. Okay, now for the good stuff. I'm sure you've been asking yourself, well, Ms. Dr. Guevara, what materials do I need? And how do I set all of this up? Where do we start? Okay, let's get into it. The first consideration is where to locate your woodworking center. Just like when you do cooking activities, you'll want the center to be out of traffic so one option is to situate it in a corner 
as you see here. Other centers or programs will place them in a corridor or a separate area. My personal preference is to do woodworking outdoors. Natural light is always a good thing. And being outdoors helps to dissipate the noise factor. At Bing Nursery School, we used to set up cones around this area so that it would look just like a real construction zone. So that should give you a couple of ideas for where to get set up. And again, the handout that you'll receive at the end has a whole gallery of different setup inspiration ideas. Okay, let's talk materials. So what you see here is the basic tool setup that we used at Bing. A pair of safety glasses, an eight ounce ball peen hammer, a C-clamp to keep your wood pieces from moving about, and needle nose pliers to hold those nails so that fingers don't get stuck or struck by a hammer. You could also use a good old fashioned wooden clothespin to do the same thing. Soft woods are preferred so we used to use pine boards that were cut into various geometric shapes that are one inch thick and two inches wide. But there are a variety of other softwoods, including cedar, cypress, fir, redwood, spruce, and balsa. So you'll need to do some investigating for your geographical location to find what's most readily available and affordable. As we saw recently, the price of lumber can skyrocket. So you want to be a wise shopper. On this picture, you'll also see what we call bridges, which are simply pieces of particle board that has been cut into square or rectangular pieces. And these are used to connect two or more pieces of wood together by bridging the gap between them. Lastly are nails. Roofing nails are recommended by many because they have a nice big head, which makes it much easier to hit when you're learning. You'll also want them to be pretty short, three quarters of an inch to an inch and a half because they'll be less likely to wobble when you hit them. Now, a word of caution. As children start out their woodworking skills, it's likely that their nails might fall out of their constructions. If that happens to occur while a child is walking to their car in the parking lot, don't be surprised if some families end up with a flat tire. That happened to me. And this is where the needle nose pliers or clothespin comes into play. Since we use wood that's only one inch thick, you'll want to avoid nails longer than an inch and a half or those children's creations will get nailed right into your woodwork bench. Or they'll poke out from the bottom, causing a safety hazard. Here's what a traditional setup looks like at Bing Nursery School. Four stations set up with tools for each individual child and lots of space in between. In the middle of the table are containers that hold the bridges and both lengths of nails. There's also a couple of plastic bins that have accessories and we'll talk about those later.
here's another woodworking table setup that's very similar. But in the background, you'll see a green milk crate, which houses the pieces of wood. And you can get a better view of those nail and bridge containers. Those are simply recycled tuna cans that have been nailed into a flat board so that they won't easily tip over and create a big mess. In this image, we see a close up view of a child using a C clamp to hold down a piece of wood while she works to connect it to a another piece of wood using those bridges we discussed earlier. And as children gain skill using all the tools, they can then start to work independently as shown in this picture. Now, some of you may be asking, well, where do I get a woodworking bench? What is the best kind? If you have $500, Community Plaything sells one that has an industrial vise to hold wood in place. Now, personally, I like the flexibility of being able to move the C-clamps to wherever you need them and being able to adjust their height to hold multiple pieces of wood if necessary. And for those DIY people, there is even a link to a resource by Pete Moorhouse on how to build your own workbench that's included in the handout you'll receive at the end. Now, Pete also provides educators with a detailed list of his recommended tools and materials, as you can see in this picture. Many of the items are the same as what we used at Bing but it's worth taking the time to look at some of the different elements in more detail. One of the first considerations is what type or types of hammers you'll have available. According to Bob Villa, that iconic home improvement expert, hammers come in three main categories, claw, ball peen, and club. Now all the research I conducted used either claw or ball peen for word working with children. So we'll focus on just those two. The claw hammer is the type that most everyone associates with hammers. On one end, you have the face for striking the nail. And on the other end is the claw to pull out nails when you mess up. The handles of these can be made from wood, metal, or fiberglass. If they're metal or fiberglass, they're usually wrapped in some type of rubber to help absorb the shock when hitting. These are great all around hammers. Ball peen hammers are a specialty type, typically reserved for metal work because the ball peen is hardened steel and better suited to drive punches and cold chisels to set rivets and shape metal. So why would you want a ball peen hammer for woodworking? If you're a professional, you wouldn't, but there are a few benefits to consider. Excuse me. Because of that hardened ball, the weight of the hammer is more equally distributed and focused on the head versus in a claw hammer having a heavy face and a light claw. So this balance allows for the force to be transmitted more evenly when you strike a nail. Secondly, because it doesn't have a claw, it eliminates one additional safety concern when working with it, because pulling nails can be riskier than hammering. 
And finally, a ball peen hammer focuses the child on the act of driving a nail into the wood and gaining that expertise first. I'm sure many of you have seen children <clears throat> start hammering only to spend the next 20 minutes using the claw. And although that has benefits, we want to focus children's learning sequentially on those acts of hammering, sawing, drilling, etc. The Pete Morehouse resource on woodwork equipment even lists the ball peen hammer as essential, but the claw hammer only as useful to have for removing nails. But there are other tools that also remove nails that are a little safer. So you'll need to give some thought as to which type of hammer or hammers you'll invest in. Now the debate over Western versus Japanese saws. To be honest, not until I was doing my research for this presentation did I know or learn about Japanese saws. In my experience working with children, we used either a crosscut saw like the one pictured here, or a coping saw, which was shown early in the presentation. It looks like a C-clamp, but has a thin blade in between. Now the primary difference between the Western and Japanese saw comes down to ergonomics. Western saws were designed for an individual standing at a workbench that is about waist high, who will use the weight of their torso to push down forward onto the piece of wood. In contrast, Japanese saws were built for individuals who were in a squatting position near the ground and whose force is oriented back and forth. Hence, Western saws cut when you push on them, whereas Japanese saws cut when you pull on them. Now for children, there are distinct advantages to a Japanese saw because it takes much less effort and coordination to pull back than to push down. And given their stature, they're not going to be putting their weight over a piece of wood. Some of you may have also experienced how difficult it can be to start a cut using a Western saw. Sometimes that saw just jumps right out of where you're trying to cut. So it would certainly be worth looking into a Japanese saw for your own programs. Again, Pete Morehouse lists the Japanese saws as a must have for sawing. Finally, if you really want to get into woodworking, you can add a manual hand drill. There are two main types here as well. For those people born in the last century, you're probably familiar with egg beaters. And so we have the egg beater style on the left. And on the right, we have the hand brace and bit type. A brace and bit type requires just a little bit more working space because you have to rotate the handle around the tool. And this tool is traditionally used for quickly boring large holes. In contrast, an egg beater style drill uses a bike pedal motion, goes around and around, forward, and is ideal for precision work like drilling pilot holes, which can be a very important preliminary step to hammering. And drilling provides another opportunity for children to experience that cause and effect 
and should be viewed as a valuable activity in and of itself. It's very satisfying to make a hole through a piece of wood. Now, one note of caution is that you might find children drilling through the piece of wood and into your work table if you're not keeping an eye on them. So once again, active supervision is key. Now let's wrap up by talking about extension and alternative activities. As children progress through the stages of woodworking we discussed earlier, they'll get to a point where their project is more art than craft. So accessories is something that can really spark their imaginations. Just about anything you'd have in your art center would find a place in woodworking. Rug scraps, wood shapes, lids of any and all sizes, beads, pieces of plastic straws, pipe cleaners, old keys, corks, buttons, CDs, other shapes of woods, paper plates, string, wire, bottle caps, fabric, you name it, and we could probably find a place for it on a woodworking creation. Pope and Hatch's 2008 article, again, in the handout that you'll get, includes several extension activities. Two that I particularly liked were sawdust play and sanding and oiling. For sawdust play, you'll need to either make or purchase sawdust. I recommend making it because you have two activities in one. So using your handsaw, either Western or Japanese, and some soft pine with some newspaper or plastic tarp underneath, just have the children spend some time sawing that wood until you have a nice, pleasant smelling pile of sawdust. Again, this caters to those kinesthetic learners who appreciate the smell and feel of freshly cut wood. Once you've collected enough sawdust for the number of children doing this activity, pour it out into metal trays or flat bins and let them play with it. They can squeeze it. They can draw in it or use it to fill containers like you do in your sensory table. If you add some water to it, the consistency changes. You can add it to mud to make firmer mud pies, just like adding straw is used to make bricks or add some glue for a whole other experience. Sanding and oiling is another great sensory experience. You'll need some scrap pieces of wood, sandpaper in different grits, mineral oil. They sell food grade types that are non-toxic. Some newspaper and some old clean rags. If you've ever had to oil your wooden cutting board, it's exactly the same process. Show children how different grits of sandpaper yield different results and then let them see how the oils will bring out the grain of the wood when you rub it in. The more oil, the deeper the colors. If you can get some tree cookies, which are basically tree rounds cut in thin slices that have rings, this is particularly enjoyable. But check out Pape and Hatch's article for more ideas, including some literacy connections and more. Letter hammering was another creative extension activity that I came across, so I thought I'd share this one too. Basically, have the children write out letters on a sheet of construction paper that's then taped down onto a two by four board. Then they'll hammer nails along that outline, creating a 3D model of the letter. It sort of reminds me of using sand letters. But maybe you'll wanna start with some baby steps. 
like hammering golf tees into pumpkins. Wooden mallets are best for this type of activity. And it's a lot of fun because you can just pull out the golf tees and start over and over and over. Another option is to hammer into layered cardboard. Simply cut pieces of cardboard into identical shapes and glue them together. Once you have a stack of about 10, you'll be set to let the children use regular nails to attach objects as shown here. It's so much easier than hammering into wood. And since all of us already have all those Amazon boxes just sitting around in our garages, it's a lot more economical than buying wood. The last option that I'll show is using styrofoam. It's a lot easier to hammer, but noisy in a very different way. In this video, you'll see that the children are also wearing some face masks because the dust from styrofoam can get all over the place and floats up into the air. So you want some extra protection to prevent inhaling this. I've seen in some programs that they wrap the styrofoam with burlap to reduce this from happening. So let's watch. You can also use golf tees with this material as we did with the pumpkins. But personally, I hate the sound of styrofoam breaking and being cut. So this is not my preference, but it might be a good starting point for you. As we come to a close, let me share the perspective of a mother speaking about her own children using real tools. We can share in their sense of accomplishment, knowing that by allowing them to take these risks, we are expecting them to succeed rather than assuming they will fail. Well, that gets us to Q and A's. So thank you for listening today and I'll do my best to answer your questions. Remember that we'll post a handout in the chat box so you can download it if you're on a laptop.